The next two episodes deal with disturbing material, particularly now in light of the thousands of remains of indigenous children found in unmarked graves across North America. We discuss the discovery of mainly indigenous human remains, including those of children, and a description of the state in which some of the remains were found. I want you to picture the pristine exhibition rooms, the white marble floors, the crystal clear glass cases of a famous museum. I'm not sure of any culture that doesn't have some sort of right or respect for those that have passed on. So why would people want to dig up native ancestors and their cultural objects buried with them? It might feel like that museum is about as far removed as you can get from the moonlit world of shovels and dirt and graves. Why was grave robbing so prevalent? But you'd be wrong. Still today, when I walk in an institution and I see sacred objects or... They're displaying objects that are labeled funerary and should not be seen by other people. It, it's like a, a, a triggering of a trauma. The theft and looting, I, I, I don't even know the right word for it. This morbid fantasy with collecting Native American people and things. Shannon O'Loughlin is a citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma and is the executive director of the Association on American Indian Affairs. Which is the oldest nonprofit serving Indian country. It's been around since 1922. She advocates for the return of indigenous items and remains to their proper nations. Starting in the 19th century, the shady act of grave robbing was a lucrative business, at one point seen as more profitable than mining for gold. Indigenous remains were used in medicine, anthropology, archaeology, natural history, and a racist and debunked branch of science called phrenology that studied things like skull shape to justify colonialism. Even the Surgeon General in 1867, I think it was, put out an order for the collection of Native American bodies so they could be studied by science and to help support this new burgeoning science of phrenology and race. These remains also ended up in many venerated museums. By that time, the study of archaeology and things in the ground was growing and museums were in competition with one another, even paying grave robbers to go out and find more items, more objects. And part of the reason for doing this was there were valuable items found in graves of Native American peoples throughout the Western Hemisphere. But second, it was an act of the conqueror. It's estimated that around 200,000 Native American remains are still in museums and other institutions in the U.S. alone. Private collectors also got in on the morbid fascination with indigenous remains and artifacts, including a 91-year-old man in rural Indiana whose collection was so big it could not only fill a museum, but also a graveyard. Hi, I'm Ben Lewis. Welcome to Art Bust, scandalous stories of the art world. I've been writing and making films about art for over 20 years. The art world isn't just high culture, big money and creative genius. In this series, we uncover the ugliest crimes, the biggest scandals and the murky in between. And today's story? Well, it's centuries in the making, and it forces us to ask the question, where do we draw the line when it comes to collecting? A sacred object from 1843 is not a piece of art. 
Of course, you know, the guy fancied himself an amateur archaeologist, but he was far from that, you know. Grave robber, you know, a ghoul. That's what the guy was. An eccentric collector named Don Miller, who accumulated enough human remains, mainly indigenous human remains, to piece together 500 people. A story about how colonialism and white entitlement has shaped what's acceptable for museums to keep in their public collections and private collectors to keep in their homes. And an operation that sprung the largest single recovery of cultural property in FBI history. On April the 1st, 2014, the FBI took over a rural Indiana farm about an hour's drive from Indianapolis. They arrived with command vehicles, tents, ATVs and squad cars. News helicopters circled overhead. It was quite a spectacle. The owner of the farm, Don Miller, was a local legend, but his status was about to change to nationally infamous. After a tip that Don Miller might have a lot of illegal artefacts hidden in his house, FBI agents, archaeologists, anthropologists and art experts scoured every corner of Don Miller's farm, assessing every piece of his collection. Elders and other members of indigenous nations were also brought on board. We had between 60 and 100 people uh, on site at any given moment. Tim Carpenter's the FBI agent who led the operation. You know, we got accused of just harassing this poor 91-year-old man to go take his arrowheads. We clearly didn't have any interest in that. We didn't take that stuff. The community did not know what we knew. I was not prepared to open boxes and cabinets and continually throughout the day encounter more and more human remains. Holly Cusack McVeigh is an anthropologist. She was one of the people brought in to help the FBI catalog and identify some of Don Miller's collection. I can tell you that the FBI agents I worked side by side with were equally shocked and saddened by what we discovered. What they discovered was that Don Miller thought of himself as an amateur archaeologist, a real-life Indiana Jones, traveling the world, excavating and collecting objects, adding to his private collection. In the basement of his farmhouse, there was a large room, impressively lined with wall-to-wall glass cabinets, housing artifacts from around the globe. There were pieces from almost every major civilization, some as old as three and a half thousand years. It might have been a private collection, but Don Miller would let anyone tour his basement museum. As we discover through our investigation, right, we, we come to learn that I think he's even had Boy Scout troops in there. But the FBI knew that Don had rooms he didn't show everybody, that the Boy Scouts didn't get to see it all. He had a full-body skeleton um, in a glass case, kind of in a locked room, hidden away. Don didn't keep that room secret from everyone. He did let some people in, and those who knew about the skeleton had been told it was Crazy Horse, the famous 19th-century Lakota leader and colonial resistor. But it wasn't Crazy Horse. It wasn't even one person. The young man who was uh, fully re-articulated by Don Miller actually represented more than one individual. I think just finding the sheer volume of human remains was a gut punch for my team that was out there doing it. The gut punch fell even harder when the team realized that some of the human remains belonged to children. There were a lot of tears, a lot of upset people. It was heavy. But it wasn't just who they found, it was also how they found them. As they combed Don Miller's farm, his basement, his home, 
the other buildings on his property, Carpenter's team discovered remains, some as old as the prehistoric era, that were unceremoniously shoved into garbage bags, into boxes, some still encrusted in dirt. What it felt like to discover human beings in those conditions, that, that'll stay with me forever. There's no doubt about that. Out of the blue, I got a phone call. And on the other end of the line was a lady named uh, Holly. Pete Coffey Onefeather is a member of the Mandan, Hidaza, and Arikara Nation. And as we began to talk on the phone, I remember very vividly sitting in my office at the university. And the more he questioned me, the more emotionally upset I became by the information that I had to share with him. Well, when Holly first called me and told me about the presence of human remains and or uh, uh, cultural artifacts, I was not surprised. I would often start by apologizing for having to hurt him um, with the words that I was about to speak. So he was actually the one who paused for a moment and then in a very thoughtful way said to me, it's okay to have this hard conversation, Holly. This is a fight that I have been fighting for my people my whole life, and I understand it well. I was not surprised at all because Native people have been dealing with desecration of, you know, not only our homelands, but of our burials and our sacred places, you know, for, for ages and ages and ages. You know, it's, it's nothing new to us. For almost two decades, Pete Coffey Onefeather was a tribal historic preservation officer. A part of his job was the repatriation of artifacts and human remains. Today, he's retired, but in 2014, he was asked to work on the Don Miller case. You know, he just had these bones in boxes, and in black marker he had written Earth Lodge Village or Missouri River Villages. So they surmised that these remains probably came from the Earth Lodge villages along the Missouri River, i.e. the Mandan and the Rikara tribes. I'm just baffled by the guy. His methods were, of course, Neanderthal. You know, the guy would just dig and dig and dig until he hit something and then, you know, jerk him out of the ground. That's all we were, was dinosaur bones to the guy. But to us... Those are people, those are human remains, and those are spirits. Their spirits are still here. Another especially morbid thing he did was, I was told he took a skull, and he cut the crown of the skull out, and he used that as a fruit bowl in his living room. And among Native people, they are especially aghast when I tell them that he had fruit in there, and people ate that fruit. I can understand racism. I can understand supremacy and all of that, but that type of a thing I just cannot understand. I'm Kareem Maddox, and I've been playing basketball since I was four years old. This year, I'm training for the Tokyo Olympics and wondering what it means to be an Olympian. We didn't want to be used as some sort of political tool. And what the Olympics mean to all of us. If one of us can win a goal, then it will mean a lot to the people all over the world. Because the Olympics have always been about more than just sports. I do think that I achieved my greatness here. Subscribe to The Greatness with Kareem Maddox. That's me. Produced by USG Audio and Transmitter Media. Don Miller was born in rural Indiana in 1923, a year before indigenous people were granted US citizenship. He lived most of his life on the farm where he was born, the same place that the FBI took over in the spring of 2014 and that housed his enormous collection. He told us that he had started out with that when he was quite young on the farm and he'd found some Native American tools and arrowheads, which are not unusual to find around here. And that sparked his curiosity, so he began doing research. 
Rick Bolt describes his friend Don Miller as a man who lived a colourful life and who didn't do anything by halves. The man was brilliant. His mind was working all the time. I don't think he ever really switched off. Don was an electrical engineer and, according to the FBI, during World War II, he was assigned to the Manhattan Project, a top-secret research team that developed the first atomic bomb. I became acquainted with Don in 1975 when I went to work at Naval Avionics. For the U.S. Department of Defense, where Don worked for three decades. Eccentric was a word people used a lot to describe Don and his hobbies. He would go out and try to find the places that nobody else had bothered with. And he told me, you go out and you talk to the locals. You drive out into a remote area and you ask them, are there any ruins out here, any places where people used to live? Rick remembers a story Don told him about an excavation in Egypt in the early 1970s. So Don was out driving down a road in western Egypt going to a site that had been described to him by the locals and he was stopped on the road in a kind of a little wash or a gully by armed Libyan guards. The guards told Don he'd crossed illegally into Libya and accused everyone in the car of being spies. Well, of course, that wasn't the case. But when you're looking down the barrel of these people's guns, you kind of comply with the request. So they all got out and the Libyans searched everything that they had in their vehicles. And the Libyans interrogated them for over 24 hours repeatedly. I mean, it sounds like something out of a bad novel, but repeatedly under lights, accusing them of being CIA agents and spies and trying to overthrow the government. And then the next day, all of a sudden, they just said, get back in your vehicles, and they threw all their stuff back in their vehicles, and they directed them to drive east and never come back. Don found ways to get things home for about seven decades. He amassed an astonishingly diverse collection from places all around the world, like Haiti, Colombia, China. Some of it displayed in his makeshift basement museum. When you saw it, you were just completely blown away. Mammoth tusks, an Egyptian sarcophagus, a Roman mosaic, pre-Columbian pottery, Aztec figurines, Ming Dynasty jade, a dugout canoe that apparently travelled down the Amazon River, Native American arrowheads, Nazi helmets. And of course, there were also the human remains. This was not done with malice or disrespect. Don was not a racist. I had never heard the man ever make any comment on anyone's race, creed, or color, or religion. Even after the FBI raid and the negative response to Don's collection, Don's friend Rick still had a hard time understanding his critics. So I think that what we got caught with here is the application of modern sensibilities to things that had happened years before. And I believe as far as his collecting goes, I think to him it was the challenge of discovering Uh, humans past and then trying to bring that to preserve it and curate it and identify it so it's not lost to the ravages of time. But Rick Bolt was surprised when we told him about some of the FBI's discoveries on Don Miller's farm, including the human skull made into a fruit bowl. I don't know how to react to that because that really was not in keeping with his overall attitude towards his hobby of archaeology. And it certainly doesn't really fit with the image that I had or that he portrayed of being respectful towards his hobby and the efforts that he had done. Shannon O'Loughlin is the executive director of the Association on American Indian Affairs. She has a problem with museums and people like Don Miller who present their collections of sensitive cultural objects as valiant attempts to preserve history. I mean, the primary experts of all of this are Native Americans. They are the ones that hold the information and the knowledge about their lifeways, their cultures, their ceremonies. 
And without that, all of these items are meaningless. They're absolutely meaningless. The idea of historic preservation was tied to the 19th and 20th century myth of the quote-unquote vanishing Indian. The belief that indigenous peoples were doomed to disappear when faced with white civilization. In fact, we still have museums, institutions, grave robbers, collectors, auction houses today that do everything they can to keep these items out of the hands of the peoples that they came from. So it is quite ironic, this idea about historic preservation and that it benefits only the colonizer and the colonizer's institutions. So, while the Western world fetishized indigenous remains and artifacts, and museums and private collectors rushed to preserve the so-called vanishing race, official colonial policy was erasure, government policies and acts of genocide that tried to make indigenous peoples and their cultures disappear. So, myself personally and other people in Indian country have a little bit of issue with the word historic preservation. Underpinning it all is the racist myth that indigenous peoples were inferior to white settlers who colonized America. And grave robbing, truth be told, was another way of displacing Native Americans from their land. So despite the fact that the federal policies during the late 1800s and the 1900s were about removing Native peoples from their lands, removing and kidnapping their children in order to send them off to boarding schools, and outlaw language, outlaw the practice of culture and religions, and would actually punish Native people by death, by withholding rations, But despite all of that, we didn't vanish. Today, there are 574 federally recognized tribes and more than 300 other tribal entities that have not been recognized by the U.S. government, but may have been recognized by state governments and other uh, partner tribes. And that's why this need to change the perspective about historic preservation and the rights of scientists and museums to hold our bodies, to hold our sacred and cultural objects, is so important for us to look at at this time. Don Miller's spoils are just the tip of the iceberg. That perspective, that point of view, that Native Americans are inherently different, that indigenous bodies and items need to be held in perpetuity, is racist and an institutionalized racist idea that just doesn't hold water, then or now. On the next episode of Art Bust, Scandalous Stories of the Art World, the conclusion to the story of Don Miller's basement. He got agitated as he saw us removing all these human remains and he came to me and asked me and I'm using his words this is the way he described he said um, why are you taking all of my Indians I understand why you're taking all the pots and stuff but I don't understand why you're taking my Indians this episode was senior produced by Debbie Pacheco it was produced by Sarah Winter and me Our associate producers are Jacob Lewis and Alexis Green. Mix and sound design by Reza Dyer. Our executive producers are Kathleen Goldhart, Katrina Onstad, Stuart Cox and Jago Lee. Our USG audio team includes Jessica Grimshaw, Josh Block, Jennifer Sears and Daniel Welsh. I'm your host, Ben Lewis. This is an Antica Productions podcast in collaboration with USG Audio. For more information, go to usgaudio.com. Thank you.